some of the ads that we were seeing on Facebook had a big, nice picture of Hillary targeting non-English Latino voters and telling them, don't stand in line, text to vote for Hillary. And so uh, Facebook soon, right after uh, that brought to their attention, they started taking them down, but you can't take that down, that stuff down fast enough. There's so much of that information. For many people, the 2016 election was a real wake-up call about the role of social media misinformation and disinformation in elections, Maria Teresa Kumar included. She's the co-chair of the Latino Anti-Disinformation Lab, which was created to address the swell of mis- and disinformation being targeted at Spanish-speaking users on social media platforms. She had her hands full at the time as the co-founder of Voto Latino, which works to empower and educate Latino and Hispanic voters. That's when she says her team started noticing some blatantly false information circulating. Give us some perspective. Why go after these voters? Why are they so crucial? As of 2018, Latinos officially became the second largest voting demographic in the United States. And they happen to be concentrated in some of the swingiest states that we know. To give you an example, even in a state like Georgia, where Latinos are only 4% of the electoral base, they make up 20% of the classrooms. In Texas, they're 23% of the electoral base, they make up 52% of the classroom. So we're expecting over a quarter of a million new young eligible voters in Texas that are Latino just in the last two years. And so, if you're trying to dissuade someone that government doesn't work, when you're trying to dissuade them that institutions are against you, you target new voters who aren't really part of the system yet. And that is one of the reasons why disinformation really is targeted in the Latino community. It's trying to get people not to trust their government so that they basically tune out. Young Spanish speakers in the U.S. are also very engaged users on social media. According to a 2020 Nielsen study, Hispanics ages 18 to 34 are more than twice as likely as the rest of the population to use WhatsApp and Telegram. And they also spend more time on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, and Discord than the national adult average. According to Maria Teresa, Spanish language misinformation and disinformation has become common on many, if not all, of these platforms. Sadly, we see it everywhere increasingly. It starts oftentimes as an innocuous Facebook page and it, or a Facebook meme, and then people start commenting. And then you can read in the comments where people say, wait, you wanna learn more about this bad information? Go to this Telegram or this closed WhatsApp group. And then you follow it and you go into these closed WhatsApp groups and then people start really getting radicalized down the rabbit hole. You know, given that the platforms say that, look, we're trying to address misinformation and disinformation. We're trying to tweak the algorithm to tamp it down. Have you seen evidence of that? Has it gotten better since 2016, since 2020? Well, I, I think that this is a conversation I've had with, with executives over at now Meta. And this, you know, oftentimes they will say, well, you know, this is misinformation and disinformation is less than 2%. And that might be true, but it's the heavily targeted of these communities that make all the difference. My mother lives in Northern California where she is the only Latina in the neighborhood. Yet she is inundated with bad information all the time. And when I ask her neighbors, they've never seen it, right? And they're next door neighbors. Maria Teresa Kumar's mother works in the healthcare industry and regularly gets her flu shot. So when she was hesitant to get the COVID-19 vaccine, it came as a bit of a surprise to Maria. When pressed about it, Maria Teresa learned her mom's concerns came from social media. But it turned out that she had been receiving messages in WhatsApp from a friend of the gym who had received it from her cousin in Texas who had received it from someone in El Salvador. And I finally got her to agree to let me see these text messages. It turned out that it was a woman who was tall and lanky with a lab coat pretending to be a pharmacist, so she had clout of, of authority, and in Spanish telling people not to take the vaccine because it was a technology never used on humans before. 
Well, going through that experience though was for me fascinating because then it allowed us to identify for the work that we do in the lab is one, how do you have conversations with your loved ones that are non-judgmental, right? You basically want them to be able to be forthcoming and not embarrassed by what they might be hearing. That's number one. But number two, what if that person was the one that persuaded her to act a certain behavior, what's another person that would change her mind, right? To make sure that she does get vaccinated. This was one of the many false rumors spread about the vaccine. The mRNA technology used in the Pfizer and Moderna shots was in fact tested on tens of thousands of people before being widely distributed to address COVID-19. We're also seeing though our nefarious actors who are buying up radio stations in Miami and they are displacing a lot of what would, you would consider neutral reporters with punditry from the right. And that is something that we are we have started seeing escalate in 2020. And we are still monitoring it because again, that is one of the most dangerous pieces of information in the sense that it becomes so concentrated that you get it from your local news, you get it from your local radio station, and you get it from your friends, and then you also get it from closed WhatsApp groups. How do you tackle so many different types of disinformation that are out there? I mean, the vaccines, people are now very familiar with how maybe they might be getting bad information, but when it comes to voting, and when it comes to sort of heated partisan rhetoric and it's coming at them in different channels. And there's also kind of a vested interest in saying that your team is better than the other. That's been the hardest uh, to navigate. But one of the things that we found was by identifying people who were vaccine hesitant, but sitting on the fence, it turned out that they have very similar markers to people who are engaging in democracy hesitant, right? And so we were able to identify the same people that are open to this bad information, disinformation, but then inoculate them with information that is the fact. And what we learned was that it wasn't the authority, whether it was the doctor in the lab code, that no longer moved these people's minds. It was the next server. It was the teacher. It was someone who could talk and resonate with the like experience. And we're fortunate that through those testings, we saw that the people who saw our ad were 54 times more likely to search to get a COVID vaccine. And so we know that one, people can, you can, there are interventions, you can change people's mind, but then just as importantly, that person not only got a vaccine, they stopped spreading bad information. So there's another type of inoculation that takes place. When it comes to finding trustworthy Spanish language sources covering the U.S., Maria Teresa recommends checking out Univision and Telemundo organizations that abide by journalistic standards. She says the Latino Anti-Disinformation Lab is also working with social media platforms to help flag false content, though she likens the process to a game of whack-a-mole, which will likely only get busier as the midterm elections approach. Until next time, I'm Hari Srinivasan, and this is Take on Fake. Thanks for watching.